after me? Yeah, and all these. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see all of you here with us. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and it is wonderful to see everyone here this afternoon for one of our public policy policy talks at the Ford School series. Um, so before I begin, I'd like to thank Carl Simon, who directs our Science, Technology, and Public Policy program for sponsoring the event today. I'd also like to welcome Director Mark Bartow of the University's Energy Institute. It's great to have you here with us as well this afternoon. Um, and we're delighted to have all of the rest of you here as well. Well, today's speaker is a former member of the Ford School and the University of Michigan, and so it's really a special pleasure to be able to welcome him back here to speak with us. And um, I will be introducing Professor Severin Bornstein more formally in just a few moments, but um, it is our centennial year, and those of you who have already been joining us for some of our events this year know that I've decided to take just a little bit of time at the beginning of each of these Your events to say a bit in context of the Ford School Thanks. Centennial. So I hope many of you have had the opportunity to look at the most recent issue last spring of State and Hill, the school's magazine. And there are copies outside if, uh, if you haven't seen it and would like to take a look. One of the things that it features is the school's history, a timeline. And that's also on our web page. And I encourage you to take a look at it. It has photos and stories from a century, 100 years of faculty, students, and staff, and alumni of the Ford School. Well, as you read that timeline, um, you'll notice that we weren't always called the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. The university first began awarding advanced degrees in public administration in 1914. And in 1946, we were called the Institute of Public Administration. That was then when that name was born. In 1968, a period we're particularly proud of, we launched the nation's first public policy degree. And the program was renamed the Institute of Public Policy Studies, fondly known as IPS. And we have many, many folks who are very fond alumni of the IPS program. It was during the IPS era that Severin Borenstein joined the community, and he made many friends and admirers here. Um, and there are a number of members of our extended family who were here during the IPS period who are still here today. That includes John Chamberlain, Paul Courant, and Edie Goldenberg. And um, we have a number of stories on our timeline about that period. I also just wanted to mention that a particularly favorite part of the school community has always been our sense of humor. We have had a long legacy of doing skits, and that continues to this day. There was also an irreverent tradition at that period known as Ips Rips, which was a uh, humorous magazine that many of the students had a, a major hand in. And I won't go into great detail, although I'm happy to uh, in other venues, because many of those articles, uh, some of them in particular, happened to roast Severin. And so it was fun to go back and to take a look at uh, some of the, the stories that, that happened during that time period. Well, in addition to all of the um, the humor and the engagement in the community and um, the many ways that uh, Severn has been connected historically. Um, he's a very highly accomplished scholar and I wanted to just spend a moment uh, telling you a little bit about that background before I welcome him to the podium. He is a very widely published in the field of energy and environmental economics since 1996. He has taught at the University of California Berkeley's Haas School of Business and there he was named the E.T. Grether Business, uh, professor of Business Administration and Public Policy in 2000. He's advised both public and private institutions, created educational software that's used in universities, courses around uh, the world, and is the recipient of a number of prestigious awards and honors for research as well as for his teaching. He's just recently stepped down from 20 years directing the University of California's Energy Institute. And he returns to Ann Arbor. We're delighted to have him spend the first half of the fall semester here with us at the Ford School. We're really glad to have you here. Um, Severin has agreed that after his remarks, he is happy to take questions. And we're going to be a little bit more informal than we are in some of our policy talk series. There will be microphones that staff will bring around. If you are watching online, I invite you to tweet your question in. Please use the hashtag policy talks, and a member of our staff will read your question to Severin. Um, and with no further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Severin Bornstein to the podium. Thank you, Susan. Um, 
Susan didn't mention that actually we were colleagues in graduate school, so uh, we go back even before the IPS era, uh, or my IPS era. Um, thank you all for coming, and it has so far been a wonderful visit here. Uh, I'm sad to say it's almost half over, uh, but it has been really fun to be at the Ford School and to get to know new people and to uh, get to hang out with old friends as well. Uh, I want to apologize for the title of this talk. Carl and I were sort of bouncing around titles. We came up with this, and we found out that le afterwards that uh, Utility means different things to different people. There is the economist view that this is about utility functions. Uh, and there is the more, I think, common view that this is about uh, something being useful, uh, which may not be applied to utility functions. Um, but uh, this, this is a reference to an electric utility and the future of the way we distribute energy and the market for that. I want to start by saying, and just being really clear on this, I'm an economist. Uh, I don't pretend to understand the science of climate change. Uh, I talk to a lot of scientists who do work on climate change, and from them I have become convinced that there's an overwhelming probability that man-made greenhouse gases are the primary cause of climate change, and that the potential for uh, major, potentially catastrophic climate change is very real. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to debate that scientific uh, area with anyone in the audience, and so maybe that will avoid some questions. Um, I, as a result, there's a great need for, to transition to other energy sources than we've traditionally used, particularly burning fossil fuels, um, ones that don't uh, emit greenhouse gases. I'm not religious about how we do that, uh, and I think it's important when we start looking at solutions to recognize that there are a lot of possibilities and that for politically, political, economic, and I think ultimately moral reasons, it's going to be critical to find possibilities that can be pursued at reasonable costs, particularly in the developing world uh, where there are many other concerns on the agenda. Uh, saying that we're just going to transition to some very expensive alternative that will ultimately undermine economic growth uh, just isn't going to be acceptable. So all options have to be on the table, and when we talk about all options, we have the traditional ones like hydro and nuclear and geothermal, uh, which have been used for years, uh, wind power, which is growing very quickly, not just in the United States, solar PV, which uh, is now starting to take off, uh, cent central station solar thermal, uh, these are the mirrors in the desert that reflect heat on, and through the heat generate electricity. Things that really aren't market ready yet, like tidal power, but are being pursued. Uh, carbon sequestration, which would actually allow us to continue to burn coal. Uh, which is a huge resource and very, very cheap. Um, and if it worked, would be a way to store the CO2 emissions and reduce the, the impact on the climate. And finally, energy efficiency, which has got to be a major player in any discussion of how we think about uh, approaching the climate change challenge. Um, all of those are going to play a role uh, to a greater or lesser extent. I think the necessity is to pursue all of them and see which ones actually work out. Um, I have been told over the last many years that each, about each of these that they'll never be economic, they'll never be able to compete with fossil fuels uh, by some people, and I've also been told by other people that they're already economic and they're already are cheaper than fossil fuels. Uh, there are a lot of views out there. I actually am not going to take a stand on where things are going to be in the future. Uh, I think predicting future technology is extremely difficult, uh, and it's certainly not my forte. Uh, but I am going to take a stand on how we can set up uh, uh, a format, a, um, a markets and institutions that actually allow us to get to the most cost-effective solutions. Uh, Way back in 2008, I had a colleague, a physicist at Berkeley, who told me that for reasons something to do with the physics of crystalline silicon technology, solar panels could never cost less than $2 a watt. Uh, 
Um, they were at the time around $3 a watt, uh, and within a couple of years, they were below a dollar a watt. Uh, and solar technology has just made huge strides in the last five years. It's incredibly exciting. Um, uh, my colleague who said this, I think, understood a lot about physics and not very much about markets for the inputs to crystalline silicon technology. It turned out a lot of things in the design that had nothing to do with violation of fundamental laws of physics uh, changed, and as a result, they were able to push costs down tremendously in a way that actually no one really predicted you were going to see that sort of progress that quickly. Um, we're not going to be able to predict technological progress. Uh, and I think that's the primary lesson we should take from the last decade. There's going to be a lot of changes, and we're going to, I hope, pursue a lot of possibilities. And some things are going to be huge disappointments, and other things are going to be much bigger successes than we could have predicted. And as a result, we, what we need to do is set up uh, institutions and markets that can accommodate that and can give the right incentives for pursuing those technologies. Um, it's critical to do that to make real progress on climate change, but I actually think there's another reason that sometimes lost, at least among the climate change discussions. And that is climate change is not the only threat facing the world. And when you get into these discussions, you sometimes run into people who say, well, we need to do this, and costs really are secondary. And it's, you just can't, I think, realistic, be taken seriously with that attitude because there are many other challenges that the world is facing, and particularly in the developing world, there are many other challenges. And costs aren't secondary in those other challenges, in health challenges, in uh, wars, and so forth. Costs are always taken into account. And those are also going to be challenges in the future, and they're going to compete for resources. So we have to be realistic about what we can really do and what things really cost. And we cannot pursue a let's just do everything policy. I think we do pursue a let's investigate everything, let's research everything. But if something's really, really expensive and shows no signs of getting cheaper, then we really have to recognize that that's probably not going to be a solution that we can pursue. What I want to talk about today is the electricity industry in particular, which of course is not the only source of greenhouse gases. In the United States, the electricity industry is about a third of all greenhouse gases directly. Indirectly, in, within industry, there's also a lot of internal generation. So some of that green is you would also, the technologies for improving electricity would also apply to. Ultimately, we might see transportation become electrified. Um, and so we might have an even bigger share coming from electricity, making the, it even more important to address the electricity issue. Um, so decarbonizing electricity is a very high priority. Uh, what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is replacing coal-fired generation. Coal-fired generation produces more greenhouse gases per megawatt hour than any other electricity source. Um, it is producing way over half of the entire greenhouse gas emissions in the electricity industry. And finding a replacement for coal-fired generation is going to be the first priority in electricity. Um, we can do that in many ways. As I mentioned, we can do that with nuclear or hydroelectric or geothermal, and there are advocates out there pushing for those. Um, but uh, they've been out, they, those technologies have existed for a while. Technological progress in those areas is likely to be slower, and each of those has real environmental concerns. Uh, so while nuclear and geothermal and uh, hydro are on the table, and I think we do need to continue to work on them, the fact is that we're also going to push ahead in other areas. And the people I frequently meet who tell me that nuclear is still incredibly cheap uh, just don't seem to be matching up with the data so I think we need to be thinking about other alternatives as well. Then at the other end, as I mentioned, there are alternatives that are really not ready for market yet. Tidal power, which is something that sounds very exciting, um, but so far we haven't really gotten the technology to turn it into electricity cost effectively. Carbon sequestration, which again, you will meet people who will tell you it's already ready and it is already cost effective. Uh, but at this point, uh, it really hasn't gotten there. So right now, we're focused a lot on wind and solar. 
Uh, wind and solar are the two renewable energy sources that we really do have a good handle on the technologies. The costs have come way down. Even recently, and wind particularly, people thought five years ago was a pretty mature technology, and it has gotten a lot more cost effective in just the last few years. Uh, with solar and wind, there is a problem that we don't face with most of these other energy sources, and that is what's called intermittency. Uh, intermittency doesn't quite capture what the problem is because it isn't just that they fluctuate a little bit up and down or that they can go within sol for solar PV within seconds from high production to very, very low production. Um, it's also that they can go for days without producing much at all. Uh, I used to live in Ann Arbor, so I remember what winter is like here. Um, and certainly there are some pretty dark days uh, sometimes many of them in a row. Um, <laughs> and so, and likewise, you can have very windy periods and periods where the wind really dies down. And so when we think about these resources, we have this additional challenge of intermittency and how to integrate these and how to use them when they fluctuate and are not predictable and not controllable. Now, of course, that wouldn't be a problem in itself if we had cheap electricity storage. And makes, what makes electricity so much more challenging than other energy sources is that the electricity itself is not storable at a reasonable cost at this point. That is another area we're doing a lot of research in. And some, there have been some exciting breakthroughs. But I've actually been studying energy since the mid-1970s. And cost-effective batteries were right around the corner in the mid-1970s, and they're still right around the corner. And so we do have uh, work to do in that area still as well. The other concern, and it is still a concern, but it has really been changing, is just the cost of these resources. But that has really dramatically changed in the last few years. Uh, just to give you to sort of fix ideas, the long run cost these days of producing electricity from a combined cycle gas turbine is generally thought to be about six cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, wind power these days is down to four or five cents per kilowatt hour in good locations. And that can sound pretty exciting, but there's a pretty big caveat, and that is the timing of wind. And this gets back to the intermittency and the lack of storability. This is wind on a typical day in California, but it's pretty representative of all, in all of North America. And that is you get a lot of wind in the middle of the night. The middle of the day, the wind dies out. It picks up in the afternoon and into the evening again. But it's basically producing power at the times you need it least, or translated into economics, at the times that it's least valuable. So while you might think that the average price, wholesale price of electricity is five or six cents a kilowatt hour, for comparison, the middle of the night price can very well be less than half that. So while wind power is getting a lot cheaper, right now it's still producing at a time, and it will continue to in North America at a time, when it's really not that valuable. By the way, in Europe, this is completely different. The Europeans, particularly in, in England, the demand for electricity peaks late in the evening because they do very little air conditioning and a lot of heating. And the wind picks up in the evening. And so actually, wind has really good timing in Europe and in some ways has very much greater potential. And I think that's a great example of how we have to be opportunistic and think about what resources match with our needs. And wind is probably not going to be a major uh, a major solution to daytime until we get good storage. But in Europe, it, it still could be a very attractive resource. And in the United States, it certainly has uh, usefulness as well. Solar power uh, from photovoltaic panels uh, has uh, also had huge gains in the last five years. It's gotten massively cheaper. Uh, but massively cheaper brings it down to, again, for comparison purposes, 11 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's still a lot more expensive than gas fire generation. Uh, on the other hand, solar power has much better timing. I'm not sure how readable this is. This dark line is wholesale prices in California. This is, again, a California example. The light dashed line is what 
solar production looks like if you point the panels uh, south. The darker line is what solar production looks like if you point the panels west. Uh, you get later in the afternoon power by pointing them west, but you get less power. The, one of the exciting things is we now can do both. Particularly in large-scale solar farms, we can mount solar panels on trackers that actually move and point to the sun as it moves across the sky. Seems like a pretty basic technology, and it is a basic technology, but it's been mastered in the last five years in a way that's very reliable and cost-effective. So when you build these big solar PV farms now, you build them on trackers so that they, you don't face this issue of what, what's the highest value uh, way, direction to point them. So solar power has a lot of attraction. In both cases, I have to just put a caveat in this. The cost numbers depend very much on where you put them. Uh, the solar cost numbers generally are in really attractive locations in uh, the southwest, for instance, in the United States. The wind power are in the windiest locations. They also, and this doesn't get as much attention, depend very much on the cost of capital. Now, everything depends on the cost of capital when you start investing in anything, but solar and wind have a particular dependence on the cost of borrowing money because all of the costs of these, of these sources are up front, almost all of them are. You, it's a completely fixed cost technology. So you spend everything up front and you get all the payoff later. So the rate at which you trade off now and the future really drives how cost effective they are. And to the extent that the cost of capital is high, these become much less attractive technologies. The third alternative, and the one I want to talk about today, and the one that the title is based on, is distributed generation. And distributed generation right now uh, means rooftop solar PV. If you work in the electricity industry, this is the thing you're spending your, most of your time worrying about right now. The idea that end users will install their own electricity source and start crowding out the utility electricity source. Um, companies like SolarCity are growing rapidly. In fact, SolarCity is doubling every year. Uh, Solar City is the largest installer of distributed generation photovoltaics, um, and for the last five years they have just taken off. Um, at the same time, utility investors and analysts are seeing this as a huge threat to utilities. In fact, Morgan Stanley put out a report recently that said the biggest threat to U.S. utilities is expansion of distributed generation that could eventually eliminate the utility. I think we are a long, long ways from that happening for reasons I'll talk about, but it is definitely a real concern to investors. So I'm going to take as given that we need to move away from electricity generation with fossil fuels, and I'm going to ask the question, is distributed generation the direction that we're going to move, or how do we figure out whether it's the direction that we, sh we should be moving? Behind this question, there are two views, the, the future of the electric, electric utility industry, and they sort of bookend the possibilities. One is, well, yeah, we need to move away from we need to move away from fossil fuels, but there are these utility scale alternatives, and the utility is going to do basically the same thing. They're just going to do it with wind, solar, nuclear, hydro, et cetera and less with coal and um, natural gas. Now, that's one view. The other view is that uh, we're going to see a complete uh, revolution in the, in the electricity industry, that within a decade, although I think that's highly implausible, um, distributed generation will be the dominant form of electricity consumption. Uh, that not only will the cost of the generation falls so much. Remember, this is still, the solar panels are still much more expensive than natural gas. But also, that the cost of storage will decline. Um, I think realistically that's not going to happen. Uh, this is the chart of grid-scale renewable energy. 
The, the orange is wind, the blue is biomass, the red is geothermal, the green that you can't really see is solar. Um, that is grid scale solar. I didn't, th this graph does not have distributed solar, but it's smaller than the green of the grid scale solar. So solar is still a really tiny part of the industry. Um, it has grown tremendously, but at this point, uh, it is being put in in places where either there is a strong economic incentive because the way utility is pricing that I'm going to talk about in a minute, or because people want to do it regardless of whether it's economic, which is fine. And I'm all for people doing that if they want to pay for it. But I think we have to keep in mind what we're really aiming at, which is solving the global climate change problem. And if it's a really expensive technology, it's not going to solve the global climate change problem. So the more moderate views are that, well, DG is going to be in the mix. And it's going to gradually grow. And some of the more optimistic views is it's going to grow pretty aggressively and become a significant share of the electricity we consume, both residential and commercial. Uh, and that's actually where the economics of either the utility industry or of distributed generation doesn't really work. Uh, and that's where the title of the talk comes from, is, uh, is the future utility of the future sustainable? Because there is a vision out there that we're going to have a utility that is providing electricity, and at the same time, we're going to have a very large share of electricity from distributed generation. And for reasons I want to try to get across today, that doesn't really, that's a model that doesn't really make sense. So imagine walking into your supermarket with a bag of zucchini and telling the grocer that you would like to trade the zucchini straight up for zucchini next month. So you're going to give them the bag of zucchini, and next month you'll be back to get, your, to get zucchini from them. Um, the store manager would probably explain that, first of all, they're not really in the business of buying zucchini on such a small scale uh, when they buy wholesale. And second of all, even if they were buying wholesale at such a small scale, they wouldn't be paying the same price that you pay retail. That is, there's a margin between the wholesale price and the retail price, and that is why you don't trade zucchini with your local grocer. Um, what is that margin for? Well, that margin pays for the building, it pays for the heat, it pays for the labor that stocks the shelves, it pays for lots of things that are mostly fixed with respect to you walking in and doing business with the supermarket. Well, that's the same problem in electricity, almost only more so. The same economics I exists. The retail price that we pay for electricity is, does not reflect the incremental cost of generating electricity. It's paying for a lot of things that are actually pretty fixed with respect to how much electricity you consume. It's paying for the distribution system, which it turns out is mostly a fixed cost. It's paying for billing and all of the contracting that the utility does for you, which, well, it is true that as they buy more electricity, their costs go up. A lot of that is fixed with the number of customers. And if each customer just consumes less, their costs do not go down proportionally. So the cost structure really is not going to allow them to just trade electricity with you at the, whole, at the retail price. But that's what we do. Um, the other, thing that, uh, the other thing that the zucchini trader is going to be asking for, or is not asking for, that the utility will, is reliability. So you flick on your light, and you expect electricity to come out. And you expect never to go to the electricity store and find there's nothing on the shelf. Imagine if the grocer had to always have zucchini in stock. Imagine if the grocer just was not allowed to ever run out of zucchini. Not surprisingly, you'd find out that there'd be a lot of zucchini that goes to waste. And sure enough, that's what happens with electricity. There's a lot of capacity that sits idle waiting for the peaks because uh, there is not really the possibility of not meeting or there's not, it's not acceptable to not meet the demand. So 
the zucchini analogy is telling us a lot about the challenge that a utility faces. And that challenge in solar has become particularly salient because in 48 states, or sorry, in 42 states, um, they've, we've adopted a policy called net metering. Net metering is zucchini trading. Um, it basically says if you have solar PV, when you produce it, you, put, you can put it into the grid and you can get it back one for one later. And that all you're billed for is the net, okay? So net metering has been adopted almost everywhere and it creates exactly the same problem that people can invest in solar PV, can sell it retail, but still are demanding all the services from the utility that they were demanding before. They are demanding that there's a distribution system that can actually meet their peak demand if their solar system isn't working. Uh, and they're demanding reliability throughout the day. Uh, so the, in a typical residential solar system, about half of the power that you generate on your rooftop is not used in your house. It goes into the system. You are constantly buy, selling power into the system and then getting power back. If you put in a solar system, and I get asked by friends all the time, you know, is this a good idea? Uh, it may be a good idea for you because of this policy, but the fact is when you buy less electricity because of solar PV and this net metering policy, the utility saves less money from you buying less than, uh, their cost, than their revenues go down. So they have a revenue shortfall. And that revenue shortfall has to be made up somewhere and it's being made up in, other, uh, in the rates for other people. That's particularly disturbing and I'm doing work right now on this because when you look at the income distribution of who puts in solar PV, uh, it is massively skewed to wealthy consumers. So this is really changing, it's reversing the, uh, the sort of older idea of, econo uh, of the economics of utilities where we are actually trying to use this, trying to have rates that help poor people, lifeline type rates. What this is doing is actually subsidizing wealthy people. But what net metering is doing is actually only ratcheting up pre-existing problems with the utility business because even before we got solar, even before we start, got net metering, uh, we had a business model that uh, really didn't charge for electricity the way its costs, were, uh, its costs came to the utility. That is, you pay a volumetric charge for electricity and in most parts of the United States, you pay almost no fixed charge. So if you consume less electricity, whether it's because of solar PV or anything else, what you pay goes down much more pro than proportionally with the, much more than the cost the utility goes go down. And as a result, uh, the utility has a revenue shortfall. So even net metering aside, the way we have set up charging for electricity for years creates the same sort of issue. That's not to say solar PV can't be part of the solution. And at some point it's possible, and I'll talk about the benefits and costs of it, that the benefits will get so large and the costs will get so small that solar PV will be the way we should go. But it does say that we really have to face up to the difference between the private incentives that people might have for putting in solar PV and society's benefits from putting in solar PV and recognize that those two could be out of line and could lead to, and this is what a lot of policy people are worried about, a big move to distributed solar when it's actually not the most cost effective way uh, to address climate change. And in doing so, raise the cost of, climate change, of addressing cli cli climate change. This wasn't always the case. And this is sort of an interesting history. If you look back over the 100 years of utility, uh, of electric utilities, um, almost all that time they were monopolists. And almost all that time they had prices that had very little to do with incremental costs. They eventually, through the regulatory process, were allowed to charge rates that allowed them to cover all of their costs. But, they, but 
any, the price of a kilowatt hour did not necessarily reflect what it cost to supply it. It didn't reflect the time varying aspect of it, that it costs more at the peak to supply electricity. It didn't, uh, it didn't reflect locational differences. And that was fine because these utilities were monopolists. They could charge pretty much what they want and people paid it. And so it was more a fairness discussion than uh, anything else to say who had to pay what because there was no real substitute. Now that is changing and it's changing particularly with distributed generation. So now having rates that are out of line with incremental costs actually does create a real problem and is part of what the threat is to utilities right now. Um, this is a bigger issue in California because California, actually you also have increasing block pricing in Michigan, but what you have is nothing like we have. So this is the rate schedule for the Southern California utility, actually a couple of years ago, but it's about right still that you, the first chunk of electricity you can buy, you buy at a fairly low price, goes up a little bit. If you go above what is about the median consumption level, it goes up quite a bit. And if you're a pretty heavy consumer, your marginal cost of the incremental con, uh, you, kilowatt hour is about 30, it's actually about 35 cents a kilowatt hour right now. Now, the true cost of providing that last unit of electricity, even when you count the cost of greenhouse gas emissions, is probably less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So what you see is if you're crowding out this, if you're avoiding paying that electricity, that, the, for that electricity, you can, you're saving quite a bit of money and can really justify a big investment in solar PV, but you're actually not saving society that. You're saving that, but if they charge a flat rate, you'd be down here, and if you actually were paying the full social marginal cost, you'd probably be down about there. This gap is a revenue shortfall for the utility. So when you put in solar PV, which you have a very strong incentive to do here, uh, you're actually, you're saving money, but that's, most of that's just getting transferred to other rate payers, not a real savings to society. Now, this problem uh, is, of course, bigger in California because I don't think there's any other state that has anything remotely as steep as our increasing block pricing. California is also the place that has half of all solar P residential solar PV. Those two are not unrelated to each other. Um, that is a big part of why. California is also a beautiful and sunny place where the sun always shines and it never rains, but, um, but a big part of it is we have very expensive electricity, particularly on the margin. The work I'm doing right now suggests that as the solar PV industry has expanded in California, we've actually seen people get more sophisticated so that they're installing systems that get them right back to here. Not wiping out all of their consumption. And in fact, Solar City has gotten very good at advising people on exactly how much they have to put in to get themselves down to these blocks because they can't compete with these blocks. They can compete with these blocks and save people a lot of money. So that means that most of the savings, we're not getting savings where people are paying the social marginal cost or something close to it. We're getting savings where people are avoiding a price way above the social marginal cost. Okay, last thing and then I would like to stop and leave time for questions. Um, when you get into these discussions, uh, a bunch of people will start raising their hands and saying, well, what about this subsidy and that subsidy and this extra benefit and that extra benefit? So I'm just going to run through a laundry list of things you've almost, if you've thought about solar, you've heard about. Um, solar produces more in the middle of the day, and I said, as I said, and that's true, and that actually increases the value of solar about 20% right now. I've written a paper on that that sort of tried to do that calculation relative to if it just produced at the overall uh, shape of demand. Um, it, solar, redu or solar PV reduces line losses because we're producing at the site, and that's right. And line losses in a typical electricity system amount to about 8 or 10%. And so that's a cost advantage for generating on site. And that's one reason eventually we might get to the point where generating on site actually does make economic sense because it does avoid some costs. 
It saves on distribution costs, the upgrading distribution costs. It turns out that's a pretty minor savings because it turns out when you put in distribution lines for a new neighborhood, you put in a huge system so that you never have to go back and dig up the streets. And so that is mostly a fixed cost. Now, that's not entirely true. You have to change transformers as the, uh, as the load increases, but mostly that's not really helping. Of course, the, the cost of greenhouse gas emissions, that's a big part of what we're talking about here. But let me just put this in context. The latest numbers on the social cost of carbon suggest that we should be thinking about carbon or CO2 emissions at about $40 a ton. I think that number's too low. Let's say $100 a ton, which is a pretty big number. Um, and $100 a ton, by the way, is, is large enough that grid scale solar starts making a lot of sense. And even at $100 a ton, distributed solar probably doesn't make much sense. Uh, so even if we start, be, and, and that's right now at least the case, that distributed solar is so much more expensive than grid scale renewables that right now it's the case that we probably, even when we price carbon to really get some reductions, that's gonna point to getting those reductions at the grid scale, not at distributed. Last point on this, you can't have this discussion without people saying, well, what about all the subsidies to fossil fuels? Yes, there are subsidies to fossil fuels. Um, there are tax breaks for coal and natural gas. There are bigger tax breaks for oil, but we don't really use oil for electricity, so I'm gonna set those aside. But for coal and natural gas, there are billions of dollars in tax breaks. But when you divide billions of dollars by billions of terawatt hours of electricity or megawatt hours of electricity, it turns out it's not very much per kilowatt hour. In fact, when you look at those subsidies, even the pretty aggressive estimates, uh, they turn out to be about a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour. So when we're, remember I was comparing six cents and four cents and 12 cents, a tenth of a cent really just doesn't change the calculation. On the other hand, solar is also getting big subsidies. 30% tax credit right now through 2016. Uh, they also get accelerated depreciation, which takes a little math to calculate, but basically works out to another 15% tax subsidy uh, for solar PV. The net metering I talked about, which basically allows you to trade zucchini without any cost to that trading. And then finally, this intermittency. If we're really thinking about moving to a heavily solar system, and this isn't just uh, distributed, it's even at the grid scale, we have to recognize that the timing of that is gonna really change if we have a lot of solar. And that has brought us to what in California is known as the duck chart, um, as you can see why. This is a forecast, and I will just be clear, this is an extreme case, but it does illustrate the problem. This is a forecast, the top line follows what is called load, that is the total demand for electricity. And then these lower lines say, well, how much is left after you take out solar PV? And the point it makes is that if you start putting in a lot of solar PV, you run into a problem that when the sun comes up in the morning, you suddenly have a big drop off in demand from the system because all those solar panels are generating suddenly. You actually need fairly low production in the middle of the day. So this is sort of turning on its head what we usually think of when the valuable electricity is. We actually will have too much electricity in the middle of the day. And then when the sun sets, you suddenly need to ramp up those other generators very quickly in order to meet the demand at the end of the day. So this, and this is an extreme case, this is a spring afternoon which is the worst case scenario in California. Uh, a sunny spring afternoon, very moderate temperatures, so not much air conditioning, but solar panels don't care about the heat. In fact, they dislike heat, they need light. And so a sunny day, they're producing, uh, a cool sunny day is their maximum production. So what's happening here is you're seeing huge production of the solar panels taking load off the system. This creates a problem, even if it's completely predictable, because when that happens, you have to have other generation, which is generally thought of as gas fire generation, ready to produce when the sun sets. But you can't turn a gas fire generator on that quickly, so you actually have to have it running 
during the day in order to be ready to ramp up. And in fact, in a recent study, um, the solution to this problem that was when looking at a lot of possibilities, including storage, the solution that was deemed most cost effective was to actually run the gas generation during the day at a low level and throw away some of the power that comes from solar PV. That is to throw away free power. Now, the economists in the room should be cringing at this. Um, it really, it does make you think if you're actually throwing away something with a zero price, that if you could send signals out into the world of we're throwing away electricity and it's free, um, people would think of something to do with it. And that's a pretty good argument for why we need to start pricing electricity to actually reflect these fluctuations. And that's going to be a huge, that's going to be a huge change that will be an important complement to integrating these uh, intermittent resources. So let me just wrap up. There's been huge progress in low carbon energy sources. Um, that's very exciting. Uh, oh, I'll get to that. Um, but I do have to point out there's also been huge progress in fossil fuel energy sources. As everyone knows, we've seen the shale, gas, and oil revolution. And that's going to continue, too. There's a lot of money on the table figuring out how to extract fossil fuels more cost effectively, just as there is with renewables. And it is not at all clear who's going to win that race. So it may be that we really are going to have to ultimately say a big sacrifice has to be made. We have to leave a lot of cheap fossil fuels in the ground if we're going to actually address uh, climate change. But it's going to be the, more, the cheaper we can get the alternatives to be, the smaller that gap is going to be and the less sacrifice it's going to require. Um, there, are, there are alternatives that are, that are um, adaptable to distributed use. That's fine, and distributed use may, for the reasons I mentioned, turn out to be a really good way to generate electricity because you avoid line losses. There are arguments about resiliency and being uh, more, more reliable in storms. So far, those aren't really supported by the technology we use. Most solar systems shut, all, virtually all solar systems on houses shut down when there's a power outage. So it's not, they're not currently protecting you from a power outage. But they could, and that might be an argument. And the technology may get a lot cheaper. But it, right now, we're sending price signals that don't reflect any of that. And as a result, we're, sending it, we're get, setting up incentives for distributed solar when it might be that central station generation of, from, from renewables is actually much more cost effective and a much better way to reduce our greenhouse gases. Uh, the current way we sell electricity doesn't sell, send those signals. What do we have to do? First of all, we have to price greenhouse gases appropriately. Uh, the appropriately is a really important word because when you talk to policymakers in California these days, they say, we already have a market for greenhouse gases, which we do. The market for greenhouse gases is clearing at the price floor right now, which is $12 a ton, which for gas-fired generation raises the price of electricity about half a cent a kilowatt hour. Um, that's not going to change anything. $12 a kilowatt hour doesn't move the needle on greenhouse gas emissions. We need to, if we're going to actually take market incentives seriously, uh, it's going to require a higher price than that. We're going to have to start pricing electricity that, in a way that actually reflects fixed and variable costs so that we don't put our thumb on the scale among of these renewable alternatives. And we're going to have to start pricing electricity that reflects the time-varying nature. Not everyone agrees on this. Uh, this is a letter from today's San Jose Mercury News uh, sent by the Sierra Club that says that PG&E, the big utility in California, is involved in some shenanigans where they're trying to uh, increase your fixed monthly charge to $10 a month uh, and that this is an attempt to kill off solar. This is definitely bad news for solar if it happens. But this is definitely a move towards prices that actually reflect the cost of providing utility service. Uh, it is bad news for de distributed solar. It is good news and supported by uh, central stations uh, or grid scale solar and wind power for exactly the sa same reason that right now what we're doing is by the pricing electricity in a way that doesn't reflect 
uh, these fixed costs accurately, we're actually giving homeowners a way too strong an incentive to invest in a certain kind of renewables that may not be the final answer. So there are a lot of alternatives. I think they're all really exciting. Uh, some of them make me more nervous. Uh, nuclear power definitely continues to have problems, both safety problems and cost problems. It's still a very expensive technology as much as it shouldn't be in some sense. There are lots of new ideas for modular nuclear power that uh, may help bring it down. Geothermal has, there's ideas for deep uh, drilling geothermal that can generate more heat, uh, but it also does cause seismic activity. Uh, wind kills birds, solar kills birds too, it turns out. Um, everything's got problems. Um, and we got to keep working on all of them. And I think if we do, we are going to continue to make progress. And uh, I think the way, best way to make that progress is to not decide in advance what the answer is, uh, but uh, let these all face incentives that actually reflect their true value. Thank you very much. Thank you, Severin. So uh, we're gathered both to celebrate uh, uh, Severin's being here. Uh, he's just retired after 20 years of directing. Retired is not the word I would use. <laughs> Been kicked out? <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's so. just finished uh, mm -hmm. his, his term of 20 year term of directing the University of California Energy Institute, and we're very glad to have Mark Barteau here who directs the uh, University of Michigan Energy Institute. Um, and uh, there are a lot of students here, and I wanted to also celebrate that there are plenty of energy-related courses here, uh, including a couple at, uh, in the School of Public Policy. So, so Katie Hausman teaches a course on, on energy and energy policy, and Irv Salmin teaches an undergraduate course here on energy policy. Uh, we've had most of the, the really uh, exciting people we've had here in the School of Public Policy were actually students of Severn, including Katie. And, and so, uh, I mean, Severn's uh, uh, impact on, on energy and energy economics is, 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 is vast, and, and so we're, we're glad they have them here. Uh, there are time for questions, and then we'll have uh, uh, refreshments thereafter. I would ask you to keep your questions to under 30 seconds and, and uh, for longer comments we'll, we'll save that for the refreshments afterwards. And we have microphones, so Josh and Katie have uh, their hands up early. Uh, so two questions. How should we think about the EPA's clean power rule in light of everything that you've just told us? And if you had a group of like motivated, do-gooder students who really cared about climate change, but found these economics overwhelming, what would you tell them that they could do? So I'll do the second question first, because that's the easy one. You don't have to understand this to, um, to contribute to, this, to, to the solutions, just as I don't understand the science and I think I'm contributing to the solution. Uh, if the science is more helpful, the, or more, something that is more appealing, that's an area to work. It turns out there's also a lot of work being done now in sort of the human factor, the psychology of energy consumption, and how to get people to change their behavior in that way. So I think that there are a lot of places, even if the economics is not that compelling or appealing to you, the clean power plan, I think I'm going to punt on because it's a half hour discussion. Uh, I, it is, President Obama has announced a new plan to change the way that, uh, to encourage states to reduce the carbon content of their uh, electricity generation. Um, it's multi-layered and I think if I start trying to unpack it, it will take the rest of the comment time. But it does interact in interesting ways with uh, the alternative, uh, alternative uh, generation sources. Josh? Um, so I was intrigued by why utilities don't, don't charge a fixed cost. And in particular, the comparison to, say, telephones. If I get a landline telephone, I pay a fixed cost, and then maybe I pay something per minute. And, and so sort of, Two questions. One is, I guess this letter gives me some idea of why they don't 
now? Why didn't they 50 years ago when nobody yeah. would have been writing letters about solar? Yeah, so first of all, there's a distributional aspect to it. The fact is, is when you move to a fixed charge, it, it has uh, uh, unattractive distributional consequences. It's regressive. Poor people do use less electricity. Um, and so that, I mean, that's also true of telephone charges, and so we could. But with electricity, um, I think regulators didn't have to confront this for many years. They were, they were regulating a monopolist. The monopolist was uh, perfectly happy to charge volumetric prices, or mostly pretty perfectly happy, and it worked. Um, and in fact, they not only didn't charge fixed charges, they went in the opposite direction of charging increasing block pricing, which is the opposite of a fixed charge. It's actually ratcheting up the volumetric part of the charge. Um, and they could get away with that for many years because there really wasn't much efficiency consequence to it. And now it turns out there really is. And in California, we're really seeing it. Uh, California solar, I mean, I showed you that small slice, but California is actually looking at much bigger solar uh, distributed generation as a result of the, um, uh, the retail rates. OK, I see a question back there. Oh. So this is Doug Kalbaugh, who uh, 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 decent dean of, uh, of uh, uh, School of Urban Planning. Doug? Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah. I can hear you OK. Oh. Yeah, a very, very old friend of mine is a colleague of yours, Harrison Fraser, has written a book about districts. It's not distributed grid, not distributed generation, but districts and neighborhoods. Something in between, a sort of middle scale, which seems very promising. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I'm not sure I'd agree it's very promising in a true societal economic impact. Let me first say, in California, a lot of what our electricity bills are paying for is the electricity restructuring disaster that's a, that's a sunk cost that we're gradually paying off. And so if you're avoiding that, you're not really doing something good for society. It is true that there are arguments that uh, microgrids might be a more efficient way to distribute electricity. Um, and I'm, if they are, I'm all for it. I, it just has to be made clear that if you leave the system, and this is a big issue right now, um, community choice alternatives, um, if you leave the system, you do it because you actually have a way to generate and distribute electricity more cheaply than the cost of doing it not then the price which includes your share of all those mistakes of the past. Because then you're just going to get inefficient exit from the system where people leave not because they actually have a more efficient way to do it, but because they're avoiding paying their share. That certainly has been an issue in the past in, uh, during the California electricity crisis. And I think that uh, we just need to set up price systems that if that turns out to be the most cost effective way to generate and distribute electricity, then it gets the right incentives. Thank you very much for coming. It was very uh, informative and uh, enjoyable, too. Um, is it the case that the net metering, uh, where the same price is charged for the electricity that you would pump back into the grid, it was necessitated by the electromechanical metering and with digital programmable smart meters and all that, that you can you have different rates uh, forward and backward? I'm not sure. I think the answer is no 20 years ago. The answer is certainly no 10 years ago when we certainly could be putting them on separate meters and have been for a long time. Um, whether how cost effective that was, I'm not sure. Now it is completely cost effective. So um, the net metering, at, and at some point, at some level, the scale was so small, it wasn't really an issue. The issue is now that the scale is ratcheting up. What's the right policy to pursue? Thank you for your interesting lecture. A uh, question that I have, in the US, certainly, and in Europe, we have a large sunk cost. What's your view on distributed electricity for the developing world where the sunk cost has not yet been invested? Yeah, so this is a really important question because a lot of people are saying, well, distributed systems make a lot more sense in the developing world. My colleague Catherine Wolfram at Berkeley is doing some work on this that is actually yielding a really surprising result. She's working in Kenya. Um, and it turns out that in Kenya, 20% of all households are connected to the grid. 
But it turns out 80% of all ho households live within 600 meters of, the, of, a, tra of a transformer. Uh, so the problem is not that they're out in some rural area. And for those people, it's almost certainly cheaper to actually connect them to the grid if you price it correctly. And this is another problem, that they're trying to actually recover a bunch of past investment. The reason that everybody lives so close to the grid is uh, to, over the last 20 years, Kenya uh, pursued a policy to hook every school to the electricity grid. And it turns out if you hook every school to the electricity grid, you're around most of the houses. And so as a result, now most people live near uh, electricity. And the most cost effective way for them is almost certainly going to be to hook them to the grid. Now, that's one special case. Again, we need to design systems that actually reflect that so that when that's the cheapest way to do it, we do it. But when the alternative of microgrids or solar PV on residential or in small and small units is more cost effective, we do it that way. First, Cliff has a question from uh, Twitter. And then there's a question here, and then in the back. Yeah, this question comes from Twitter. Are there any models to follow, i.e., places where electricity prices accurately reflect costs? Do we have to fix this from scratch? There are a lot of models. There are ones that are pretty old. It turns out that meters for 40 years have been able to do simple peak and off peak pricing, and France has been doing that for at least 40 years. Uh, so there, people definitely are able to adjust to this. Um, there are also more recent models, more on the industrial level, uh, where we're uh, seeing uh, in New York State, for instance, large industrial customers have been forced to pay time-bearing pricing for the last three, or forced as the default, if they can find somebody to sell them power um, on a fixed rate, they're welcome to, but the default is time-bearing pricing. So we, we're, we're getting more and more experience with it in how People find what people find acceptable and what they don't find acceptable. And I think we are going to gradually figure out a way to move to pricing that makes more sense and reflects real costs. Hi, right, back to the fixed cost. Uh, at least in California, do we know if we were to set the fixed charge for the, the customer to fully match the fixed cost of utility, what that number would be? I'm guessing it's a lot more than $10 per month. It might be, but actually that's not the way you would want to set it. What you'd want to do is you'd want to set the marginal price to reflect the marginal cost and then figure out what's left over. It turns out that the fixed charge might not be that, might not be that high right now because utilities don't have to pay for their greenhouse gas emissions. But if we actually priced it as if they did, the utilities would rec recover a lot of revenue and we might not need a very big fixed charge. Eventually, we probably would. Um, eventually, the average residential electricity bill in California is $60. It wouldn't surprise me. In fact, I think I've seen an estimate that the fixed charge would be 20 of it. Um, that is where Sacramento Municipal Utility is headed, and they are sort of the leaders in this in the state. Yeah. So you um, s seem to downplay the, the role of subsidies, if I understood that right, and a little bit deferred the notion of talking about the uh, EPA kinds of rules, and that caused me then to wonder if you have some general picture of whether government has a role to play, uh, and if so, what general kind of role might that be? Oh, yeah. So maybe I should have said this up front. I, government clearly has, I think, two very important roles to play. First of all, greenhouse gases are an externality. Markets don't solve externalities. Uh, we need rules that make people take those into account. And that's true whether it's greenhouse gases or auto emissions or other sorts of toxic pollutants. And that the role of the government really has to be to figure out how we're going to get producers of this pollutant to incorporate that. The other role that I think is widely agreed upon by economists in the very basic research is that we need to subsidize basic R&D because the market doesn't provide enough incentive. I actually have a much more expansive view of that than most economists, and I think 
if you watch this up close, you develop this, which is it's not just the basic research. There's huge spillovers even as you go downstream from a company trying, being the first one to try something. There's huge knowledge spillovers. So subsidizing the first carbon sequestration uh, plant, subsidizing the first nuclear, the first new modular nuclear power plant, subsidizing the solar thermal plant in the Mojave Desert. I think all of those made sense. There was huge spillovers in the learning, um, and so we should be doing a lot more of that. So there's obviously dissent on the effectiveness and the future of all of these alternative energies. How is it possible to find objective information on um, projected growth of geothermal or tidal or projected cost? It is certainly possible to find objective estimates but you certainly wouldn't want to take them as facts. You'd want to take them as wild guesses. Because if you had taken the objective estimates of solar PV uh, 10 years ago, you would not be where, see where we are today. Um, technology changes in really unforeseen ways. Uh, for instance, there are colleagues of mine at Berkeley, and I'm sure here too, are working on biofuels. And it's turned out to be a lot harder in some areas to get plants to give up their, to break down in a way that makes them cheaply convert to biofuels. Some people projected that was going to be the next breakthrough. It, you, the way you see this most clearly is you get in a conference of electric vehicle people and you get in a conference of biofuels people and each of them speak as if the other doesn't exist. So the biofuels people just know biofuels is obviously the way we're going to do transportation, and it's just a matter of which biofuels. And the electric vehicle people think biofuels make no sense at all. And so everyone is working on their particular technology, and they don't know what, which ones are going to win, even when they tell you they do. All right, I just want to make a comment. I have a property in northern Michigan, uh, and consumer power is the uh, utility. I always get a $30 a month uh, fee, even though I, I don't go up there most of the time. So I assume that's a basic rate. Um, that, that's an extremely high fixed charge for the United States. It's not actually for some other areas, but that, yes, there are places where fixed charges are higher than that. As I mentioned, Sacramento, they're moving up to $20. But um, most of the United States, uh, Detroit Edison is $6. That's not even close to where you would end up, I'm pretty sure. If you break out distribution costs versus electrical costs, because they seem to be different animals. Yep. What, what percentage of it is, what percentage of the total is distribution cost? Yeah, so that, that varies massively. In California, it's on the order of a third. In the Northwest and the Southeast, it's probably over half um, because they're generate the Northwest is using hydropower and the Southeast is using coal. So the energy component is much smaller there. And so the distribution cost, which doesn't change nearly as much across systems, um, is a much bigger share of the bill. The back of the envelope number that gets used frequently in electricity systems is that distribution um, uh, runs three to four cents a kilowatt hour. And that's actually a pretty reliable number. Um, but the entire price in the Northwest is on the order of six or seven cents a kilowatt hour, whereas in California, um, the average retail rate for the utility I showed you is 17 cents a kilowatt hour. In New York, it's slightly higher than that. I'm going to stand up so we can see each other. Uh, you um, mentioned a number of the drawbacks of, of nuclear power, and I certainly agree that there, there are drawbacks, but it also certainly has some advantages in terms of continuity of service, of greenhouse gases, em emissions, and so on. And modular uh, nuclear power plants seem like a promising idea. Do you see that coming in the near future? I'm an economist. <laughs> no. um, it is definitely an idea that is getting a lot of excitement. Um, it's gotten a lot of excitement for five or ten years now, so I'm, it gets a little less exciting the longer we're excited about it. Um, but, um, but it's definitely one of the technologies we should be pursuing. The basic idea is nuclear power plants are incredibly expensive to build, but each one is built idiosyncratically on its location, that if we could just build them in factories 
and the idea is essentially rail car size uh, plants that you could just stamp them out and they'd be much cheaper. Um, it's really exciting. I hope it comes true. We really need breakthroughs, but I have no idea if it really will. So we could put them on our roofs like we do our... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our future is the... Uh, sorry, one more question there and then we'll go to Irv. Okay. Yeah, um, the distributed generation of rooftop solar is a big issue in California and California, California utilities, but is it uh, creating any anxiety in, in utilities in, in, in other states in the United States? Oh yeah, um, actually in some places you'd be pretty surprised to see. So it's creating anxiety in the Southwest and that sort of makes sense. But actually the state that has the plan right now that's creating the most disruption is New York. New York is, has a plan under proposal at the New York Public Service Commission to completely revamp the way they regulate utilities to make them into distributed service providers where they are buying and selling electricity, including from every household, and to change the entire way they regulate it to make them purely a middleman. Um, and utilities are pretty nervous about that. Now, does solar make sense in New York? Probably not yet, but if you make the subsidies large enough, they can. You know, so, solar doesn't make, well, I'll tell a quick story. I recently, a few years ago, talked to a guy who was showing me an estimate of the production of a new plant in California, and he said, look, there's this plant in Leipzig we built in Germany where uh, our estimates really nailed what actually happened. And I said, yeah, but the capacity factor is 10%, which is like almost a little over half of California. To which he said, well, of course, Germany is a stupid place to build solar, but our estimate really nailed it. <laughs> um, Germany is the biggest, produce, uh, biggest installer of solar PV in the world, and Germany is not a sunny place, but if you subsidize it enough, um, you're, going to, uh, you're going to make it cost effective, and utilities are very worried about that. So let me okay, ask let me. the last question earlier, because it turned out our refreshments will run out soon. But before I do that, let me introduce Jim, Jim Cook, who, uh, Jim, um, who uh, is a, a past vice president and deeply involved in consumers' power in the gas industry, so I, I wanted to welcome you. Uh, Irv teaches an undergraduate course for you undergraduates on, on uh, energy policy, and, and we'll let you have the last uh, question. I, I have a question that I haven't got a clue what the answer is. But if you I look at the either. current distribution of generators in the U.S., there's a significant number, not in total power, but just number of activities in municipals and in uh, cooperatives. Do the cooperatives and municipals have the same pricing problem, or are they able to recover their fixed costs? And if that's true, is there a model, or are things to be learned about running these small-scale systems from looking at the existing cooperatives and municipals? Well, yeah, my knowledge of this is mostly in California, so I'm gonna speak to that, and I'm, maybe somebody else knows more about um, Vermont, particularly, which is just all small cooperatives. California, one of the utilities, Sacramento Municipal Utility has been the leader in getting this right. They're moving to time-varying pricing. They have big fixed costs. Um, they, they really ha are very forward-thinking. The other is Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which has been the trailer in getting this right. They have pretty much a straight volumetric charge. They are the largest coal burner in the state of California by far. Um, and so. I have been told that one of the differences is LADWP is part of the city of Los Angeles and is under tremendous pressure to generate revenues for the rest of the city, whereas SMUD is a completely separate utility uh, organization and just does what it thinks is best. So there may be organizational stories there about what allows a utility to transition to things that make the most sense, but I certainly wouldn't want to get too far ahead of that from two examples. So there are refreshments. They'll only be there for half an 